fringed dresses. For women, it was different. Hope began to dim for a woman when she turned twenty. By twenty-two, the whispers in town and at church would have begun, the long, sad looks. By twenty-five, the die was cast. An unmarried woman was a spinster. On the shelf, they called her, shaking heads and tisking at her lost opportunities. Usually people wondered why. What had turned a perfectly ordinary woman from a good family into a spinster? But in Elsa's case, everyone knew. They must think she was deaf the way they talked about her. Poor thing, skinny as a rake handle, not nearly as pretty as her sister's. Prettiness. Elsa knew that was the crux of it. She was not an attractive woman. On her best day, in her best dress, a stranger might say she was handsome, but never more. She was too everything. Too tall, too thin, too pale, too unsure of herself. Elsa had attended both of her sister's weddings. Neither had asked her to stand with them at the altar, and Elsa understood. At nearly six feet, she was taller than the groom's. She would ruin the photographs, and image was everything to the Walcotts. Her parents prized it above all else. It didn't take a genius to look down the road of Elsa's life and see her future. She would stay here, in her parents' house on Rock Road, being cared for by Maria, the maid who'd managed the household forever. Someday, when Maria retired, Elsa would be left to care for her parents, and then, when they were gone, she would be alone. And what would she have to show for her life? How would her time on this earth be marked? Who would remember her? And for what? She closed her eyes and let a familiar, long-held dream tiptoe in. She imagined herself living somewhere else, in her own home. She could hear children's laughter. Her children. A life, not merely an existence. That was her dream, a world in which her life and her choices were not defined by the rheumatic fever she'd contracted at fourteen, a life where she uncovered strengths heretofore unknown, where she was judged on more than her appearance. The front door banged open, and her family came stomping into the house. They moved as they always did, in a chattering, laughing knot, her portly father in the lead, red-faced from drink, her two beautiful younger sisters, Charlotte and Susanna, fanned out like swan wings on either side of him, her elegant mother bringing up the rear, talking to her handsome sons-in-law. Her father stopped. Elsa, he said. Why are you still up? I wanted to talk to you. At this hour? her mother said. You look flushed. Do you have a fever? I haven't had a fever in years, Mama. You know that. Elsa got to her feet, twisted her hands together, and stared at the family. Now, she thought, she had to do it. She couldn't lose her nerve again. Papa. At first, she said it too softly to be heard, so she tried again, actually raising her voice. Papa. He looked at her. I will be 25 tomorrow, Elsa said. Her mother appeared to be irritated by the reminder. We know that, Elsa. Yes, of course. I merely want to say that I've come to a decision. That quieted the family. I, there's a college in Chicago that teaches literature and accepts women. I want to take classes. Elsinor her father said. What need is there for you to be educated? You were too ill to finish school as it was. It's a ridiculous idea. It was difficult to stand there, seeing her failings reflected in so many eyes. Fight for yourself. Be brave. But, Papa, I am a grown woman. I haven't been sick since I was fourteen. I believe the doctor was hasty in his diagnosis. I'm fine now. Truly, I could become a teacher, or a writer. A writer, Papa said. Have you some hidden talent of which we are all unaware? His stare cut her down. It's possible, she said weakly. Papa turned to Elsa's mother. Mrs. Walcott.